time to ramp up your excitement, perhaps with a splash of anxiety too, as we start today's episode going over Starship's current status in Boca Chica, Texas. Then we'll debrief this week's Starlink mission, check in on Crew Dragon and Demo 2, feature Space Force in today's honorable mention, and then finish with your questions in Kevin's classroom. That's me, and this is SpaceX in the News. Exciting times are upon us once again as the next Starship serial number preps for its upcoming stress test. Yesterday, SN4 made its way from the high bay down Highway 4 to the launch site where it was placed upon its stand. Elon shared an image of the beast taken from a drone and it was mounted in place and being prepped for its upcoming round of tests. If you're an eagle-eyed missile man, you may have noticed a few groupings of heat shield tiles radially attached to the hull. These are mechanically attached to steel studs on the body and done so for testing purposes exposing both to cryo temps and heat during the static fire. This was also done last year during Starhopper static test. Elon has been spending basically all of his time this year in Boca working on Starship with his engineers. And loving it, aren't we all? But the good times are just getting started. Party at SpaceX's place this weekend, but for the sake of safety, nobody's invited. More road closures have been put into place and they're quite lengthy in duration. Things could start chilling down and then heating up as early as tomorrow, a new notice to airmen is also on the books with the FAA, closing down airspace in the area up to 1,500 feet through the 28th. If all goes well, we could see three Raptor engines hop this thing to various low altitudes. I will be live streaming some of these activities for my eccentric members, so you can join me for that. Otherwise, keep an eye on my Twitter for the play-by-play. -play. Last week, we talked about some design changes SpaceX was implementing into Starship's flap designs, but we won't be seeing them until the next Starship rolls out. And they won't be huge changes, but even these small changes meant to simplify things and reduce the number of parts can have a surprisingly big effect. SN5 is already being assembled at the Starship factory, which is insane, and will definitely have header tanks. And for the first time since tip gate, a nose cone. Maybe even flaps. Definitely flaps on SN6 though. The oxygen header tank will remain in the tip of the nose cone even for later crewed versions. It's important to keep it there to maintain the center of mass forward during atmospheric entry. Flat spins are bad, okay. Not to worry, these tanks are quite small relative to the main tanks, so they won't take up too much space in that forward viewing gallery. The Raptor engine that will be powering these starships are going through many development tests right now, and a fourth one has been spotted at the construction yard in Boca. And Merlin is doing acceptance testing right now because its design is stable. But what is the next step to getting Starship to Mars once SpaceX manages to make it to orbit? That would be orbital refilling taking two starships, one tanker, one commercial, and autonomously docking them in space around the Earth and transferring the propellant. Docking is something SpaceX already has successful experience doing with Crew Dragon, so it shouldn't be too bad. Some of you have been asking when the Super Heavy Booster will begin construction, and I'm still optimistic for 2020. It's something they'll begin doing as soon as Starship completes its suborbitals, starting with the 20 clicker. Elon did say a while back that the booster will be much easier to build compared to Starship, because basically it's just a Falcon 9 made of steel. All right, speaking of Falcon 9, let's go ahead and debrief this week's Starlink launch. On Wednesday afternoon, SpaceX launched the 84th flight of their Falcon 9 rocket to place their seventh batch of 60 Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit. This launch officially made the Falcon 9 the most used operational rocket on the market, beating out the Atlas V. And it brought the Starlink constellation tally up to 422, which includes the two 1010 prototypes that launched first. However, it should be noted that a few are being deorbited and a couple others are no longer in operation. So sorry, potheads. During the webcast, it was revealed that the cleaning lady was to blame for last month's Merlin shutdown. A small amount of cleaning fluid was trapped in a sensor dead leg and ignited during the flight. Apparently, part of the post-flight refurbishment process is to intoxicate the engines by baptizing them in alcohol. Blasphemy. But this time, all nine engines were sober for the flight and successfully landed the booster for its fourth time on the drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. Miss Tree and Miss Chief were on float by out in the Atlantic, but did not attempt to catch the used fairings because of pending software upgrades. But I do wonder if this was a last minute issue because judging by Elon's tweets a day earlier, he too was expecting to attempt another catch. The other drone ship, just read the instructions, has been out of the spotlight ever since it made its journey from the west coast to the east coast last year, because it's been at port receiving upgrades. Well, Greg Scott captured some images this week of crews finally mounting its new thrusters and also the generators. The suckers are huge. Because of the heavy launch manifest on the East Coast, eventually both drone ships will be utilized once again. 
Elon has opened up a little bit more about dampening Starlink light pollution, saying that Launch 9, which I guess would be two launches from now, will take up sats that will be less noticeable during orbit rays by changing the solar panel angles and using new sunshades. This week, occupiers of the space station captured an image of the previous flock of Starlink satellites orbiting the Earth. They may be reflective, but they're beautiful. Elon has said in the past that the first regions to have access to Starlink service will be Northern America and Canada. Well, the private beta will begin in about three months, with the public beta starting in about six months. In other news, NASA announced a press briefing for Demo 2, but didn't invite the press. Administrator Jim and SpaceX COO Gwyn will be in attendance to hypen up and inform the public about next month's historic launch of Bob and Doug. I hope you can join me as an eccentric member so we can watch the conference together. But as far as the actual mission is concerned, Jim is asking people to stay at home for the launch. Quote, join us in this launch, but do so from home. We are asking people not to travel to the Kennedy Space Center. They will even be trying to separate control room operators as much as possible. NASA is looking into adding plexiglass between the seats and the stations. The last word I received from NASA is that they are still looking to invite a limited number of media to the launch. Now it's time for today's honorable mention. The United States Space Force welcomed 86 second lieutenants into their ranks at the Air Force Academy's graduation ceremony for the class of 2020. And Elon Musk congratulated the new officers on their achievement. The years ahead will see incredible change in air and space technology, and you're going to make it happen. Congratulations, class of 2020. You hear that? No stutters. Nailed it. A week from now, the Space Force will begin receiving applications from officers and enlisted personnel currently serving in other space-related career fields and other branches of the military. Starfleet begins. Okay, you all listen up, meow. In this week's segment of Kevin's Classroom, we're taking a question from Sky from Brisbane, Australia. Might. No yelling on the bus! Why do rockets have rocket boosters and when they're flying, why do they fall off? Very good question, Sky, and I love the name. You know, in one of his movies, actor Zach Galifianakis once compared his feelings of emptiness to that of a rocket booster, saying, they just fall off and burn up in the atmosphere. Nobody cares about rocket boosters. Well, that's not entirely true on all fronts, because for one, I like rocket boosters. They're really cool. In fact, the only reason I don't love them is because my love is reserved for parachutes. Get it? And yeah, while most rocket boosters do burn up in the atmosphere and crash into the ocean never to be seen again, some do get reused. NASA reused the Space Shuttle's SRBs, or solid rocket boosters, with the help of parachutes. And of course, SpaceX reuses their Falcon Heavy's liquid-fueled side boosters by landing them on pads. Blue Origin also reuses its boosters for their new Shepard rocket, and Rocket Lab is working on it. But with that being said, Zach isn't entirely wrong. Since the days of Apollo, most companies still use them and then ditch them forever. But why even use these radially strapped boosters? That's what we call boosters attached to the sides of rockets. Well, if you have a heavier payload to take to space, you're going to need more thrust, or delta V, or what I like to call boom time, to get it there. Occasionally, a single center booster just doesn't provide enough explosiveness all by itself to get the rocket off the launch pad. To lift the load, sometimes even rocket boosters could use a happy little friend. So we strap a few more boosters onto the side of that baby to give it some more oomph. Go power and through sheer teamwork, the job gets done. But the drawback to this is that once these boosters are done burning, they become dead weight, slowing down the rocket with its extra poundage and drag. Gross. So we terminate the friendship and say our goodbyes, and off they go. And you know what? It's always satisfying to watch. Sometimes when playing Kerbal Space Program, I'll just keep launching rockets to that point and then start over again, and again. Staging is a blast. There's even something called asparagus staging, using liquid-fueled side boosters to feed propellant from one set to another, dropping each off in tandem as they empty. In theory, this would make rockets even more efficient, but has never been utilized. If you think back to last week's lesson on rocket engines and how complicated it can be to pump fuel into them, you may be able to appreciate the complexity of feeding fuel from one tank to another, in flight, evenly, and without adding more weight. But hey, if you manage to crack the problem, I'm sure NASA would love to hear from you. So get to work, students. Well, that's all I have for you guys today, but I'd like to give a special shout out to my eccentric members who support the making of these videos for everyone to enjoy. If you can't get enough SpaceX news in your life, check out the description below to sign up for more eccentric content, including our midweek episode where I share my personal opinions on the topics at hand. 
But whatever you do, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and that notification bell, yeah, on that side, so you never miss an episode. There's also a like button around here somewhere. And to thank you for being so rad by watching to the end, below in the description is also a link where you can enter for a chance to win one of our new American Ingenuity tees. You can do so when it starts at midnight tonight, that's Eastern time, and you have to be a US resident. Please don't shoot the messenger. Good luck. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a normal weekend. Until the next time, Godspeed.